Hello friends and neighbors, it's been a while since I've done a video for the Ultimate Recommendation Book Club, and I could tell you that that's because I've been working on a whole bunch of other things, like other reviews, and trying to find a job, and moving, and all that sort of thing, and all of those things would certainly be true, but there's actually another reason why it's been a while, and that's because I decided to make the next book on the Ultimate Recommendation Book Club, Looking for Alaska, and to be honest, this one intimidates me a little bit. I love the book. I absolutely love the book. It's on my ultimate recommendation list for a reason. It was not only my introduction to young adult literature, but it was also my introduction to the idea that all of that stuff that you learn to do in English in order to read critically isn't a waste of time. That you can tell a story beyond just the words on the page. In a sense, reading Looking for Alaska might be the reason why I do what I do here. With Looking for Alaska, people have analyzed this book to death. And of course, there is the admittedly very slim possibility that the author of this book, John Green, might stumble upon this particular analysis of Looking for Alaska, and he might say that he hates this particular analysis of Looking for Alaska, and that I got every single thing wrong, which of course he would never do because books belong to their readers, but still, there's that nagging fear. But I'm just going to have to set my fears aside and do this. So here we go. Ultimate Recommendation Book Club, book number three, Looking for Alaska, by John Green. Like I said, this book was my introduction not only to young adult literature, but to critical literary analysis in general, and so it kind of holds a special place in my heart. And I'm going to split this particular analysis into two parts for before and after. That's pretty predictable, but that's what I'm going to do here. And the first thing I want to talk about with regards to this book is the structure. Looking for Alaska does not have a traditional three-act story structure. It is structured, as John Green put it, like this. You've got the before section and the after section, and it all pivots around this thing that happens in the middle of the book, which you don't learn about until you finish the before section and get into the after section. In fact, those of us who have read Looking for Alaska before always get kind of an uneasy, guilty feeling whenever we see somebody reading for the first time saying, I finished the before section! Yeah, because we know what's coming. And I will go ahead and say this now, this analysis is going to contain spoilers. It's a deep analysis of the book, it really can't be avoided, but I'll give you the warning anyway. So we have this structure and we have a series of events, but the only way that this series of events is really connected is these are things that happened while Pudge was in his first year of boarding school. That's basically what this book is. It's a series of events that happened before the middle section of the book and after the middle section of the book. It's not a traditional story structure and yet it works for the story that this book is trying to tell. This is essentially the story of Alaska. Yes, Pudge is the narrator and the protagonist, but this is Alaska's story. It's an analysis of her character, and her character is not going to be tied down by traditions or set to a traditional format, and so why should the format of this story? In general, Looking for Alaska explores two major themes. The first theme, quite obviously, is death. I mean, death saturates this novel, even in the before section, before Alaska actually dies, Death is a big part of this novel. We see this in the very beginning of the story, when we learn of Pudge's obsessions with the dying declarations of famous people, the last words of famous people that you would write biographies about. He's fascinated by this idea of what went through a person's head as they were dying, or what was the last thing a person thought before their life suddenly ended. And he is of the belief that what a person thinks when they are dying, or what a person says when they are dying, says a lot about how that person lived. And there is a certain amount of truth to that. You can read a lot into a person's character when you look at their dying thoughts, their last thoughts, what they were going through when their life ended. But as we learn as we read the novel, even though that is an apt observation, it's also a pretty big oversimplification, which leads us actually to our second theme. I didn't even mean to do that. The second theme that we explore in this novel is the idea of perceived reality versus actual reality, the ideal versus what's really in front of you, the 
pretensions that people put on versus what's actually going on in their lives, a theme which is explored in much more depth, of course, in Paper Towns. But even though that is the central theme of Paper Towns, it really is kind of the central theme of this novel, too. It kind of gets eclipsed by the whole death thing, but it is a pretty central theme. You see a lot of it in a lot of what's going on in this book. First of all, you've got the fact that Pudge's parents believe him to be a much different person than he actually is. They believe at the very beginning that he is the type of person who wants a going away party as he goes to boarding school. They believe that he is the type of person who has lots and lots of friends that he wants to say goodbye to, despite the fact that Pudge has indicated to them many times that this is not the case. And of course, the party turns out to be a complete bust, only two people show up and they don't stay for very long, and Pudge isn't really that great of friends with them. I also really like the cranberry sauce. It's a little thing, but his mother is operating under this persistent belief that Pudge loves cranberry sauce, even though he hates cranberry sauce. She's completely wrong in the matter of his taste in this regard, but she continues to fervently deny that he hates cranberry sauce because she wants to believe that he really loves it. We also see this a little bit with Pudge's obsession with dying declarations. He has this ideal when it comes to death, and we'll explore that particular aspect of that theme when we get into the after section of the book, but in this before section, before he actually experiences death himself, he has these ideals concerning the end of life. And as we learn, as we read the before section, there are a lot of pretenses from a lot of different characters. A lot of characters kind of putting up these masks, putting up these ideals in front of them that turn out to be either completely false or extremely misleading. And some of these aren't even intentional, like the fact that Chip, or the Colonel's physical appearance uh, particularly him being so short, is in complete contrast to the huge personality that he has and the fact that he is such a natural leader. And then, of course, there's Alaska, who is a beautiful girl, and Pudge's crush on Alaska is immediate. As soon as he sees her, he likes her. Like, he doesn't even have to get to know her at that point. He just likes her based on her appearance, and he actually goes on this whole soliloquy about curves and the beauty of curves on a girl's body. He's paying absolute attention to her appearance, to the mask that she has in front of her, the completely unintentional mask that she has in front of her, and isn't really even considering yet what is deeper there. And an extension of that, when he does get to know her a little bit personally, there is this contrast between the bubbly, cheerful Alaska, the mischievous Alaska that he really does have a crush on, and the, as she puts it, the crazy, sullen bitch. There's a dark reality underneath Alaska's bubbly exterior that she doesn't allow very many people to see, and Pudge kind of gets a glimpse at that dark interior towards the end of the before section. And it's interesting to me that Pudge kind of idolizes both the Colonel and Alaska to a certain extent, because they are both very big personalities, and they are both the types of people that Pudge really wants to be. One of the most oft-quoted quotations in this book is that Pudge is Drizzle and Alaska is the Hurricane. That's one that keeps coming back over and over and over again, because he sees himself as so small and insignificant compared to this force of nature that is Alaska. And he sees that Colonel has a streak, a streak of getting kicked out of the basketball games, and Pudge wishes that he was the type of person who had streaks to maintain. He wishes he was more like the Colonel. And it's interesting that of the various characters in this book, the ones that Pudge most wants to be like, the Colonel in Alaska, are the two that are the most monumentally unhappy and screwed up and angsty. Because they have a lot of positive emotions and positive personality traits, but they also have a lot of really equally negative personality traits that he just doesn't see at this point. He blinds himself to them. In fact, the other two people in this barn circle, Takumi and... Takumi? I think that's how you pronounce his name. I don't know. I'm sorry. Takumi and Lara, or Lara, pronunciations are hard, those are the two people that seem to have their lives pretty well in order. They seem to be pretty well adjusted. In fact, Alaska says at one point that Takumi needs to stop worrying about other people's problems and get some of his own. Takumi really doesn't have 
many problems. He doesn't have many ghosts or, or skeletons in his closet. He's just kind of a straight-laced, normal guy. And yet Pudge doesn't want to be like him. He wants to be like the screwed up people. He wants to be like Alaska and the Colonel. And he doesn't even know why he wants to be like them. Another way that this theme of the ideal reality versus the actual reality is explored is in the world religions class that Pudge takes with the old man. This is really the only class that gets any kind of exploration. Like, we know he's taking all these other classes, but it's world religions that gets the most time on the page, and it's the old man in particular that we get to hear from the most. In fact, I think the only other teacher that we actually hear dialogue from is the French teacher. And the old man is another contrasting character because he is physically very weak. He only has one lung. He walks very slowly because he has to. He isn't very forceful physically because he can't be, because he is incapable of being very physically active because he only has one lung. But, as far as his personality is concerned, he's very forceful. He is very much another big personality. He's very knowledgeable, he's very stern in the classroom, and he has very big ideas that he is going to impart to you in his classroom, whether you like it or not. And of course, he talks about world religions. He talks about these faith-based ideals that people for centuries have kind of come up with in order to cope with the real world. Kind of building these stories and building these lofty ideals that these founder figures had in order to strive for something and be something beyond what reality has given us. And whether you're a religious person or not, that is essentially what religions and what faith-based organizations do. They are supposed to inspire us to believe in something and aspire to something bigger than ourselves. So like I said, the before section is kind of just this series of events that have these two themes, and I haven't really talked about the death theme much yet, but obviously we'll talk more about that in the after section. But they have these two themes that they are attempting to explore, and so it's just kind of a series of vignettes, of moments throughout the year. And it's important to point out that there is a difference between the Pudge that exists in the story and the Pudge that is telling the story. Just like with stories like To Kill a Mockingbird and The Catcher in the Rye, there is a narrator from some future time period well after the story has taken place. And so there is the Pudge that is telling the story to us that already knows everything that's going to happen, and the Pudge that's in the story that doesn't have a clue. And for the most part, those two personas are in sync with each other. Like, the narrator Pudge doesn't give really much indication that he knows what's going to happen. The only indication that we have of this is the structure of the story, the before structure. The fact that this scene is taking place 136 days before, 128 days before, 92 days before, or whatever the number of days is. Why would he be counting down to something unless he knows what's going to happen? We don't think in those terms until the event has already happened and we know about it. And so that's really the only hint that we get that the pug that is telling the story knows that something is going to happen. And for that matter, we know that something is going to happen. Even though this reads very much like just kind of this typical year in the life of this kid who is trying to discover and, and find the great perhaps and gain more in his life and all that sort of thing, even though that is true, I lost track of what I was going to say. Even though it seems like that, we still know as we're reading that something is going to happen, and we might think it's a good something or a bad something or whatever, but we know that something is going to happen. There is a countdown to something happening. We are getting these hints as we read the story. And as we get closer to that something happening, the narrator Pudge starts to hint at that something that's going to happen. So at the end of the before section, they decide that there is going to be a pre-prank to set up the actual prank that the junior class is going to set. And this is another case of ideal reality versus actual reality. Everyone thinks that this is the actual prank, but the actual prank comes later in the after section. So we have this pre-prank, we have our five main characters staying out in the barn, things are happening between Pudge and Lara and it's completely adorable and all that sort of thing. We have the 
best day, worst day game, which is also a very significant glimpse into all of these different characters. What kind of day did they have on their best day? What kind of day did they have on their worst day? And we find, again, that the Colonel and Alaska have the best best days and the worst worst days. They are the most polarized because they are the most polarized characters. Pudge and Takumi and Lara are all kind of on the same basic level. Like, even Lara says that her best day and her worst day were the same day. So after all of that, they head back to the school, and of course they're all exhausted from the prank and all of that sort of thing, and Pudge says at the very end, and this is one day before, Pudge says at the very end of that section, I should have done something significant that day. I should have done something more, but I slept 18 hours out of a possible 24. And it also kind of harkens back to that idea of last words, of dying declarations, of saying something significant before you die. Does that actually happen, or do we kind of recreate those dying declarations? Do we give them more significance than they actually have? And then on the last day, we get an even stronger indication. Again, we have an actual reality versus a pretense with the relationship of Pudge and Lara with the really awkward blowjob scene, which of course everybody's talked about, and the relationship between Pudge and Alaska, which is them making out, but not really getting too far physically, but having a really, really intense emotional connection. Of course, John Green's talked about this to death, and so I'll just mention that because it is significant in adhering to that theme. But at the very, very end of that section, when Alaska is freaking out and saying that she has to go, and she has to go, and, you know, now, and they have to set off the fireworks and give her cover so she can leave and do whatever she has to do, they don't even know, he says all the things that they didn't say, all the things that they didn't do. He says, we didn't try to stop her. We didn't tell her you're too drunk. We didn't try to calm her down. We didn't tell her it can wait until tomorrow. We just left. We did what she said without questioning it. At the time, you don't think about it. At the time, you don't say, these are the things that we should have done because you don't know that you should have done them yet. And so that is when there is a breakaway between these two narrate between these two pudges, the narrator pudge and the in the story pudge. Um, and the last line of the before section is that we slept like babies which, again, I don't think you would really think about unless you are saying we slept like babies even though this horrible, horrible thing was happening. And of course the horrible, horrible thing is Alaska's death, and the next section is the after section, but that's a section that we are going to look at in the next portion of the Ultimate Recommendation Book Club, mainly because I only have two minutes left on my memory card, and so I need to wrap this up. So thank you for joining me on this long-awaited next episode of the Ultimate Recommendation Book Club. The next section of Looking for Alaska we will be looking at is, of course, the after section. We'll take that straight to the end, and I hope to see you then. Happy reading.